Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon conference call with Trust Unlimited. This is Jim George speaking. I'm the non-attorney spokesman and facilitator for Trust Unlimited, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to this call. I frankly don't know where this call is going today. Um, I was away on vacation for the last 10 days. As we all know, it's been a very eventful 10 days, historic 10 days. And uh, when I finally was able to get back, uh, our trip from Destin, Florida, which was supposed to take five hours, took two days courtesy of CrowdStrike. Uh, and I want you to remember that name, CrowdStrike, because I'm going to be discussing CrowdStrike in this call. I was not able, obviously, to prepare the call I would like to have had for today. However, uh, over the course of the last couple of days, uh, I've been able to revisit some things that we may have forgotten that are kind of important. But uh, this country is in a very precarious situation right now. And uh, I'm going to be touching on some of these issues. Uh, let me mention one thing about CrowdStrike. Uh, the left has a peculiar way of naming things. You think, well, why would you call something CrowdStrike? Well, this organization is a global cybersecurity network. And uh, as I get into this, I think you'll understand why the name is appropriate. But before that, let's just talk a little bit about what's going on in Iraq. Fortunately for those of us that are holding currencies, Sudani is really on a mission. Since I've been away on vacation, he has rejected attempts of the parliament to change the budget tables. Uh, he's going to defer to his council of ministers. He's basically just kicking them to the curb. He's ignoring them. They can go to the Supreme Court if they think they have a legitimate case, but they don't. So he's just proceeding as though they don't exist. And uh, to the extent that the parliament uh, does anything uh, of a dramatic nature, it's usually uh, the nefarious uh, pro-Iranian members of the parliament that are up to no good. So Sudan is basically done with them. <laughs> In the meantime, the CBI has issued $43 billion in penalties to banks that continue to use the dollar. Sudani is basically doing everything he can to shut down the uh, dual monetary or currency system, i.e. the, the uh, auctions. And so corrupt individuals are not going to be able to make money on the spread between the official and the street rate. Uh, and uh, that's good news as well. He's proceeding with the project to delete the zeros, and now they're talking about the lower denoms going onto the ATMs, so they're proceeding. But I think the most important thing that happened was Sudani made a public statement, and he said that Iraqi citizens will see a new exchange rate this year. So this is right from the horse's mouth. So many of the politicians in Iraq, and in this country for that matter, say things in a way that are sufficiently ambiguous. They can mean a number of things. But this was a crystal clear and unambiguous statement. You will see a new exchange rate this year. Worst case scenario, forgetting whether we're talking a fiscal year or calendar year, worst scenario is calendar year December. That's five months from now. I know we wanted this five years ago or whatever, but that's where we are. The guy that's in charge, in Iraq at least, is still the right guy. So what it looks like is going to happen is that they're going to go one-to-one -one with the U.S. dollar. That is the Iraqi dinar, and it'll be on the forex at a dollar. And uh, in a matter of uh, weeks, if not days, should be back to 322, which was the value of the dinar against the U.S. dollar when it went into the program rate, and at a time when the nation state of Iraq was not nearly in as good a shape as it is today. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the situation in Iraq. But so much has happened in the last 10 days in this country that we, it cannot be ignored. 
we have an election coming up in November. And when I went away on vacation, Donald Trump was ahead in five of the six swing states. And so the election interference had to go into full swing because for reasons that I will discuss briefly, they simply cannot allow this man back in the Oval Office. (laughs) Plan A, open the border and allow the illegals to come in. Why? Well, they can't have a pandemic this election year. They play that card and it's not going to fly. They did try with the bird flu a few months ago, but that got shot down immediately. And, uh, The swing states are not going to be permitted to allow their governor, lieutenant governor, or attorney general to change election laws in the states. That's been dealt with. Election law on a state-by-state basis is done by the legislature, not by the executive branch. So if there's no pandemic and they can't unilaterally change the laws or keep Donald Trump off the ballot, they're just going to have to flood us with illegals, give them driver's license, and hope that they're going to be able to vote. Plan B was to retire Biden. But uh, he's not going quietly into that good night, or at least he wasn't planning to. So they had to come up with another way to uh, remove him. And it's funny, uh, I, I... was watching the news and they put a clip of the view that tv show those five cackling hens with the cumulative iq of a kumquat were comparing uh biden's decision not to run for re-election with george washington's retiring after the revolution and the stupidity of these women is so profound that I had to make mention of it. Those of us that know history know that it was a very poignant moment when George Washington said, no, I'm not going to be a king. I'm not going to be an emperor. We fought a revolutionary war precisely so that did not happen. So we will have elections. We will preserve the republic, and I will go into retirement. George Washington's hero was a Roman by the name of Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus who found himself in the same situation but instead he wanted to preserve the republic and went to retirement to his farm and these idiots on the view compared Joe Biden's departure with that of George Washington Joe Biden is leaving the White House because Nancy Pelosi called him and said Kamala's going to 25th Amendment you, and you're going to leave in shame. So take one for the team, leave of your own, and we'll build you up as a great American. And that's exactly what happened. Plan C, of course, was to remove Trump, who their internal numbers said they couldn't beat with their lawfare. A series of civil suits um, and criminal suits. The one that seems to have stuck is the one in New York, which is a particularly ridiculous case with a ridiculous judge and a ridiculous court. Uh, Plan D, unfortunately, was to remove Donald Trump from the planet. And, of course, we had the assassination attempt in Butler, PA, not unlike what happened to JFK, where the alleged shooter was really a patsy, who, of course, didn't survive the incident. The real shooter or shooters are, to this day, unknown. Uh, But it it failed, and Trump survived, and he's even stronger for it. So now they had to go to Plan E, which was Biden has COVID. And uh, for the good of the country, uh, he even if you won the election, couldn't survive for four years. Of course, their lies keep running into their lies because, as you will recall, Joe Biden was vaxxed and boosted on television. He made a big deal about pointing out that the pandemic was the pandemic of the unvaccinated. So supposedly the man that was vaxxed and boosted now has COVID. So 
you know, the, the truth just isn't in them. And as I said, <clears throat> Biden gets COVID, and in the meantime, Pelosi makes the uh, late night coup de gras call and explains to him that if he doesn't leave quietly, he'll be 25th Amendment, so he's gone. Plan G is to build Kamala up. She is the next coming of Obama. Kamala Harris is a blithering idiot, but the party cannot kick a black woman to the curb, destroys their entire narrative. So whether they want her or not, they've got her, and they're, once again, just going to build her up, let her take all of her cheap shots, media's back her up 100%. But there's one other shoe that's got to drop, and that is the sentencing of Donald Trump in September in the New York case. Of course, it's just a coincidence that all of this happened the year of the election. This should have been done three years ago, assuming they had a case, but they brought the case, and this is what they've done. <clears throat> However, Trump still has a couple of cards to play. First, because he is a previous president, because he is the nominee of the Republican Party, because he is leading in all of the polls, and because they tried to literally take him out and kill him, he has what, in my opinion, is a legitimate case to fast-track the appeal of the New York case to the Supreme Court. And if that occurs, in my opinion, the Supreme Court will issue the most scathing reversal of a federal case in American history. I could go for 15 minutes on the absurdity of that case. Now, these people in Washington are nefarious. They're not stupid. They know that case is absolute garbage. Yet they pursue something like this. So hopefully the Supreme Court will have the wisdom to remove this absurd case from the record books and allow the president to run for office. Now, why is it they want to remove Trump? Why don't they want him to run? It's not because they don't like his tweets. It's because they don't like the fact that he is reversing what they're doing. Began all the way back with Obama, the fundamental transformation of the United States from a constitutional representative republic to a one-party social democracy. And every time you hear someone say saving our democracy, your first thought should be we're not a democracy, but your second thought should be why are they saying that? It's because what they're trying to do is create a democracy. They don't like the republic. They really don't like the Constitution. And since the initial progressive movement in the early 20th century, they have tried for over 100 years to get around the Constitution, and they can't do it. They just can't do it. But a second term of Donald Trump is going to do two things, in, or actually three things, in my opinion. The first is there was, should be and will be an audit of the Federal Reserve. What have they been doing since their creation in 1913? And we're going to find that the Federal Reserve of the United States, which is part and parcel of the Western Central Bank system that was initially established all the way back in 1604, has been the longest standing uninterrupted criminal enterprise in world history. Second, I think what will be released are the files on the JFK assassination. And third, what I think is going to be released is more information on CrowdStrike. Now, as I said earlier in the call, the reason my flight was delayed was because of a glitch with Cloud, CrowdStrike. And as I said, CrowdStrike is a global cyber security network. Now, that name should be vaguely familiar to some of you, but I'll remind you. When they impeached Donald Trump the second time, it was because of an alleged conversation he had with Zelensky in Ukraine. Now, I don't want to go into Ukraine as part of the money laundering scheme for the left in this country. But one of the things Trump specifically mentioned in his call with Ukraine 
was CrowdStrike. And that's what set off alarm bells with the left and the Democratic Party leadership. Now, when I trash members of the Democratic Party, I'm not talking about the rank-and-file citizens that support the Democratic Party or their alleged underlying beliefs of the Democratic Party. I'm talking about the leadership of the party. I'm talking about the Obamas, the Clintons, the Schumers, the Bidens. I'm talking about these people. I'm not talking about the voters. It's they, it's they and the Democrats that go after the voters. And I'm not talking about the voters. But the next couple of months are going to be epic in this country because this can't continue. There cannot be a quiet war between two factions using the American citizens as their little pawns. One side is going to win and one side is going to lose. This is where we find ourselves. But don't take my word for it. Do a little research on CrowdStrike yourself. Just the name itself. Why call yourself CrowdStrike? I mean, the people on the left, they, they like to use words that are almost making fun of us. They like to use symbols right in front of our face where they communicate with one another. They like to use these dog comms uh, like they're speaking a different language. They're in the room with us, but they're speaking a different language. You need to really understand what's going on here. Now, why do I bring all this up? What's this got to do with our currencies? Well, I will tell you. When this thing finally goes down, whether you have dinar or other currencies, we're going to go to the bank. But today, you will not be exchanging your dinar or other currencies for United States dollar. Such does not exist. You will be exchanging for a Federal Reserve note. It's a debt. We owe a private corporation a debt. We have to circumvent that because we purchase these currencies. We've done without things in order to hold these currencies. We've patiently waited for decades for these currencies to revalue so that we could go to the bank and exchange them for what? Federal Reserve note. But we need to protect that money, and there are a couple of ways we can do that. The first thing you need to do is establish, and I'm not going to get into it today, our Family Asset Protection Trust package because it preserves your privacy, it protects you from <clears throat> civil litigation, but it protects the federal government from stepping in and intruding into your private affairs without going to a court and showing cause. And the other thing is this, once we do this exchange, for reasons that should be obvious by now, we only need to hold as much <clears throat> currency as necessary for liquid purposes. And we've discussed other things you can do, one of which is to transition to one of the state digital currencies. I don't like the digital currency per se. I prefer a physical asset. But if you have a state digital currency like Texas, Montana, and other states that are establishing them, you'll be out of the federal system. You'll be out of the credit core system that they're trying to set up. If they ever establish a federal digital currency, they'll – know everything about you, how you're spending your money. It's none of their business. Whether you're buying a stick of gum or an AR-15, it's just none of their damn business. So if you're going to have this money, if you're going to purchase these currencies, if you're going to wait 20 years to do the exchange, the least you can do, it seems to me, is to make damn sure that you're in complete and total control of that money and it's no one's business but yours. <laughs> so that's my rant for today. As I said, I've spent the last two days in an airport. I'm not happy about it. I haven't been able to prepare the call that I wanted, although I've been able to make copious notes over the last 10 days watching what these people in D.C. are trying to do to us. We just simply cannot allow it. We cannot allow it. <clears throat> now, for those of you that are calling in for the first time or 
have not at least contacted us to get our initial no obligation package. The information that I ordinarily discuss on our call is available to you in that package. You can get our initial no obligation package by contacting us by phone or email. The package does contain everything you need if you wish to proceed, but you're under no obligation to do so. You can contact us through our email, which is trusts with an S, unlimited LLC at gmail.com, or our phone service, which is 307 274 4122. Contact us again either by email or phone. We'll be happy to send you our initial no obligation package. If you wish to proceed, everything you need is included in the package. If you have additional questions, you can contact us by phone or email. I'll get back to you as quickly as I can, although I probably have over 100 people I need to contact since uh, not only was I away on vacation, but I had a two-day lapse in an airport where I just wasn't in a position to return emails and <clears throat> phone calls. But again, thanks so much for listening to the call. We are in a very perilous, perilous position in this country right now. There's a lot going on that we're not privy to. Um, because of my background and experience uh, and some of my associations, uh, I'm probably a little bit more aware of what's going on than most individuals. You're certainly not going to get the truth from the media. I've never seen a pack of congenital liars go on the way they have in the last 10 days. It's, it's absolutely nauseating to listen to these fools just rattle on. So it's up to us to do our homework. It's up to us to get our affairs in order. It's up to us to place our assets, our wealth, our net worth, and trust in out of their hands. Remember, the one thing they have not been successful in over 100 years of the progressive movement is to get around the Constitution of the United States. And we're going to beat them to death with it if necessary to protect ourselves. So thanks so much for listening to the call, everyone. I'm sorry it's such a quick call, but for the reasons I've stated, it's the best I could do under the circumstances. Our next call will be scheduled for next week. Certainly, if something of a dramatic nature were to happen between now and then, we'll try to schedule an emergency conference call and get back to you. But failing that, we'll be back next Wednesday, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. So thanks so much for listening, everyone, and have a great week. Recorded.